tell us briefly about yourself and the research you have been pursuing for the last several years. Well, my group works in embedded computing. And the past couple of years, we've been trying to figure out how to use embedded computers to build in intelligent buildings. And in particular, to make those buildings aware of the occupants, what the occupants are doing, where they are, and, and then to respond to them either, you might say, verbally with some sort of feedback about how much energy they're wasting or how they could improve their lifestyle, or also in terms of automation, so controlling the lights or the heating and cooling um, to make the building more energy efficient. Uh, today I wanted to discuss about failures and successes in computer science research. Reading papers or attending conferences, we get the impression that every single project is successful, every project results in something getting faster, smaller, or bigger, more insightful, and an outstanding publication. Is that so in your experience starting from when you were working on your own PhD? Certainly most of the papers we try to publish um, do make things better, sort of on and off in, in daily life. I don't think uh, certainly everything is not successful. Um, I can give you a, a number of examples in my graduate career when, um, when things failed, you might say. When I first, first got to Berkeley, I was working on sensor node localization. This was kind of a hot topic at the time. There were a bunch of embedded processors, wireless, um, that people envisioned to be scattered around um, environments, maybe in fields or in buildings. And we wanted to know where they were. Maybe we could figure out where they are based on the, based on the radio signal strength or based on something like ultrasound ranging. Um, and so we built our own um, ultrasound ranging technology. And one of the things we had to do was avoid collisions, uh, because if you collide an ultrasound in the ultrasound domain, it's very hard to detect that there was a collision or which node, uh, which node actually made the transmission. So we used the technique that we borrowed from um, some MIT work, uh, Cricket where we transmit radio signals simultaneous with the ultrasound message. That way, if there was a collision we would, in ultrasound, we would also get a collision in radio, and we'd know that. And that was supposed to prevent um, the number of errors caused by collisions. And so um, we tried that, but we were still getting pretty significant errors, and we couldn't figure out why. So this was work I was doing at the time with Fred Jung and Alec Wu. And so we decided, well, let's run a controlled study. Let's create some collisions um, intentionally just to make sure that this technique works. It worked for the folks at MIT, so it must work for us too. We just want to borrow and use what we can to get our job done. Um, and what we found was that it wasn't working for us. In fact, um, when we had two nodes transmit radio messages at the same time, one of the messages would always get received. And we had a very hard time actually causing a, um, data corruption just by transmitting messages simultaneously. And this is something that um, we work at the physical layer knew quite well. It's called the capture effect. But we didn't really know about that at the time. Um, and, and the reason it didn't happen to the folks at MIT was that they were using uh, AM radio. We were using FSK radios. And so the capture effect was much stronger. And so all of a sudden, we realized that the entire system we had spent um, almost a year or more building um, just wasn't going to work. We needed a way to detect radio collisions. And we created one, basically, by changing some low-level operations in the physical layer to detect when um, the capture effect is actually occurring. And that technique is today used in about half of all the Zigbee radios on the market today. Um, so that was, a, that was a big failure in our lack of understanding of you know, how radios really work. And it turned out to be um, evolved into a technique that was quite, um, quite well received. Um, so we moved on, and we tried to do radio signal strength um, localization as well. And one of the challenges we had with both of these systems was, you know, if you're building a system with 25 or 50 or 100 nodes, and you want them to do some big distributed localization operation, that's um, not that easy to program unless you want to have a base station involved, and we didn't. Um, so, so distributed programming of these embedded devices, wireless embedded networks, was, was quite challenging. And so we created a bunch of different um, what you might call programming abstractions, things like um, Hood and Marionette. And um, these, you know, this, was a, this was a challenge. We, we couldn't program the system. It took a really long time to do. Um, there was also a MATLAB-based um, programming abstraction. This was just to get the localization job done, but it turned out that these systems were also quite well received. And um, Marionette, for example, is used in uh, products from two different companies and is still being sold today. So another challenge, we couldn't get this thing programmed, had to come up with a solution and come up with one. And then we moved on and finally got localization, distributed localization to work. The final results in my dissertation showed that it didn't really work. So yet again, uh, you know, third time, 
things didn't work out as we had hoped. The results, you know, certainly it's hard to publish something that says this doesn't work. Uh, so what we had to do, what I had to do was basically um, find the conditions where it does work and find the conditions where it doesn't work and show this works sometimes, it doesn't work other times, here are the conditions where it works, it doesn't work. Turns out the conditions where it works, radio signal strength, mesh network localization, um, is a pretty narrow range, and it's probably not going to be a super practical thing. It'll work in some cases, but we established that it doesn't work, and that's actually a, a result, even though it's not a positive result, it's a negative result in some sense, um, but it's a result, and there are you know, hundreds, if not thousands, of papers that basically show that wireless RF mesh network localization does work without all the extensive experimentation. Um, so I feel like it was an important result because it uh, sort of put uh, a, a period at the end of a lot of a lot of work in that area. But again, a negative result. So, you know, certainly in, in my graduate career, I've had experiences where there's been a lot of a lot of um, ups and downs, lots of positives and negatives. Of course, all the papers we've published um, try to show the positive aspect of those results. Now, you work as a faculty and you have advised many masters and PhD students. Do you have thoughts on the type of failures and successes they have experienced? Um, yes, absolutely. I think that, well, the, the types of failures, I think, are very similar. People try to push the limits, and it doesn't always work. It's, and what I'm seeing over and over again is, the, is this personal struggle with what happens when things don't work. The key is how people respond to um, a technological failure. And in some cases, people, people will uh, abort the project. In some cases, they'll divert their focus and try to solve the problem. Or in some cases, they'll get around the problem and try to achieve their goals in some other way. You know, it's kind of cliche today to say something like, uh, if, if you know it won't work, if you know it will work, then it's not really research. Uh, but I think that's true. What is it that makes that an interesting uh, cliche? Well, it's our job as computer scientists to not really find products that can be developed today with just a little bit of cleverness, um, but rather to find the products that people will want and will probably be trying to build uh, many years into the future. And which of those customers, you might call them, customers of our technology, will not be served well if technology continues on its current course. So it's our job to have a vision that's compelling and more or less feasible, but at the same time pushes beyond the limits of current technology. This is when failure occurs, and this is, this is a good kind of failure, uh, because it's an opportunity to shift the course of technology, uh, if the original vision is compelling enough. And so I think the key for you know, students who are experiencing technological failure in their, product, in their projects um, is to try to identify whether it's a a fundamental limitation on the on the course of current technology. And if it is, try to solve that problem because that's an opportunity, not really a failure. Now, you suggested that failures are an important part of the whole research process. Do you have any insights on a good way to balance the possibility of failure and risk-taking in computer science research? Um, balancing failure and risk-taking, that's an important question. Um, to answer that, I'd like to distinguish between two different kinds of failure. There, there are probably several different kinds of failure in research, but at least two of them are very common. One is experimental failure, and one is technological failure. So the first kind, experimental failure, um, doesn't need to be balanced with risk-taking. That just needs to be, to be managed. So people uh, sometimes, for example, design experiments where they forget to collect certain data, or they forget to implement the baseline, or something where when they get to the end of their six-month or 12-month study, they don't have the results that they really need to make this a great paper um, and a great result. Um, that can be managed just by a little bit of foresight into what actually needs to be done during the study. Um, and experience plays a big role here. So the more studies people go through, the more they realize what mistakes they make, and they can, they can have a bit more foresight when they do their, their future studies. The second kind, which is the technological failure, that's the kind that I think is interesting. When you're pushing beyond... You put, you know, push, pushing technology beyond um, its current limits and, and trying to change the course of technology development. Um, and here there is a risk-reward balance. So the more um, the visions you, you choose to try to pursue that are way beyond the capabilities of today's technology are the ones that are the most exciting to pursue uh, because they can change the course of technology the most. And the ones that are just on the more margin of what current technology can do are the ones that 
are um, less risky, but also potentially less rewarding. And uh, I think the solution to this is just portfolio management. Um, so choose some risky projects and some safe projects. And experience plays a bit of a role here, too, um, because it's not always easy to see where the research challenges are, where, where you're pushing beyond the, the current technological limits and what the pitfalls might be there and how long it's going to take to, to bridge the gap between what current technology can currently do and where you want to go. But um, I think people, you know, that's, that's the fun part, and this is the, this is the kind of um, risk and reward balance that I think is, is fun to manage. So in our current projects, um, we have a couple of projects that are pretty risky and very, very far outside the current technology and some that are, are low risk. And, one of the low-risk projects, one of the first ones we used to get this project started, um, is what we call the smart thermostat or self-programming thermostat. Uh, basically, it's a learning thermostat that learns the occupancy patterns of people in a house and then tries to automatically configure the thermostat settings. About four or five years after we did our work, um, Nest Labs released a product called the, the Nest Thermostat that is their version of a learning thermostat. Now, the fact that the company came out with a product four or five years after we did our, our work probably means that wasn't super risky, right? We, we thought it would work. Um, it did work. And so that was a fairly safe project, although I think a pretty exciting one. There are other aspects of this work where we're trying to do very fine-grained occupancy detection, for example, um, room level occupancy, who's there without any wearable tags or cameras, and then also trying to figure out what people are doing in terms of um, you know, lights and water fixtures and appliances. And this is something that I don't think we're going to see on the market in four years. Um, I think we I, although I guarantee that 20 years from now, this kind of thing will be there. So this is where, you know, this is a, this is a farther out um, time horizon. We're looking at you know, 10 or 20 years out, and we're trying to identify the challenges in current technology, or the li limitations of current technology that make this kind of work hard. Is there such a thing as a good time to take a step back, reassess, and maybe even give up? A good time to... To step back, well, I think you step back every day. Um, so those are all different times. So step, is there a good time to step back and reassess? I think you do that constantly. You know, lunchtime is a great time to do that. Sit down with some colleagues and brainstorm about the, the most recent news, tech news that came out, and where, what does this mean about technology? Where are things going? What, could, what opportunities are opening up? And this is part of the way I think people develop that portfolio I was talking about earlier. Um, if you want to manage risk and reward, you have some high-risk projects and some, some uh, low-risk projects. And you can come up with new projects all the time just by sitting around and chit-chatting about technology. Um, is there a good time to give up? Well, this is an important question because I, I've seen students going through this exact question in their heads many times when they approach technological failure. It looks like things aren't working the way we had expected them to. What do we do now? Um, do we give up and try to find something new? Um, I think at that point, if you haven't already found something new, then no, uh, because we should be every day, you know, at lunch or at, over dinner or whenever we happen to be thinking about um, technology in general, coming up with new project ideas. And instead of giving up on a project because it's not looking promising, I think more likely people are always going to move on to the most promising project. So we don't really give up on a project because it's not going to work out. Instead, we move on to another project because it's more exciting. Some results that we get might show, oh, this project is not really going to be as exciting as we thought it would be. There's another project I've been brewing in the back of my head for the past six weeks. Maybe I'll start developing that a little bit more in the background and see if it takes off, see if it has, um, see if it has any, uh, any grip on the road. In this conversation, we learned about different aspects of success and failure in computer science research. Thank you for sharing. Thank you.